Please welcome the first person to prove that lifestyle changes can reverse heart disease and other chronic illnesses, and the founder of Ornish Lifestyle Medicine at ShareCare, Dr. Dean Ornish. I want to begin by thanking uh, Jonathan Weiner for making it all possible for us to be here today. I want to talk today about the power of lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine to me is the most exciting trend in medicine today. It's a, it's a wave that, a tidal wave that hasn't even begun to crest. And what I call lifestyle medicine is using lifestyle changes not only to help prevent disease, which we all know, but to actually treat it and even reverse it, sometimes in combination with drugs and surgery and often as an alternative to that. Uh, the, the program is a whole foods plant-based diet that's low in fat and in, in sugar. Uh, it's not one versus the other. Uh, mostly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and soy products. Moderate exercise, various stress management techniques including uh, meditation and yoga. And what we call psychosocial support or support groups. Uh, or to reduce it even further, to eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. And people often have a hard time believing that these simple changes can make such a powerful difference, but they do. And in our 40 years of work, we've used these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. And the more diseases we study and the more underlying biological mechanisms we do research on, the more reasons we have to explain why these changes are so powerful and how quickly people can get better when they make them. Our diet's been rated number one for heart health by U.S. News and World Report, a panel of experts there, uh, just about every year since 2011. And after doing this work for so long, I think there's, our time has finally come. This is finally the right idea at the right time. And the reason is that, on the one hand, the limitations of drugs and surgery are becoming more clear. I mean, we've all benefited from drugs and surgery. In a, in a crisis, they can be life-saving. But for chronic diseases, they don't work as well, and I'll, t I'll give you some examples of that. And at the same time that the limitations of drugs and surgery are becoming clear, not to mention their costs, the power of these very simple lifestyle changes is also becoming very clear. And I'll go over with you the studies that we've done to show that. And as we move more different forms of payment that are more value-based and volume-based, uh, the economic incentives are falling in line as well. Um, this is a slide from the American College of Cardiology's annual scientific sessions in Chicago a year or so ago. Kim Williams was the president of the American College of Cardiology. He found his own cholesterol level was high, his LDL was 170. He didn't want to go on a lifetime of cholesterol-lowering drugs, he knew all too well what the side effects were. And so he did a literature review, came across our work, went on our program, and his, his cholesterol came down by about 50%, and he wrote a blog about that in, in Medscape. And at this session, over a thousand cardiologists came. That wouldn't have happened just a few years ago, as a sign of the time. Now, when I talk about the limitations of drugs and surgery becoming clear, Many people are shocked to hear that angioplasties and stents really don't work in stable patients, even though we spend tens of billions of dollars on them each year. They don't prolong life, they don't prevent heart attacks. And then a few months ago, uh, the cardiologist would say, well, they, at least they reduced angina. And I don't know how they got this through the Human Studies Committee, but they did a randomized trial of people with heart disease. One group, they actually put stents in, the other, they put a tube in as though they were gonna put stents into their heart, and they just pulled it out without doing anything and they found the reduction in angina was the same in both groups. In other words, that the stents really didn't work to reduce an, uh, uh, ang angina. And you find the same thing in prostate cancer. You know, prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men other than skin cancer. And yet a major randomized trial in the New England Journal of Medicine last year showed that after 10 years, men who did nothing lived as long as those who had surgery or radiation. Even though the surgery radiation often maims guys in the most personal ways, you can't have sex because you're impotent, or wearing diapers because you're incontinent for no real benefit. It turns out maybe one out of 50 men benefit from the surgery radiation. And yet if the choice is between doing nothing and something, when a guy knows he has a tumor growing, most guys want to do something, even if the treatment is worse than the disease. And so we offer a third alternative, which is a lifestyle intervention, and as we'll talk about in a moment, that's been actually proven to slow, stop, and reverse the progression of men with early stage prostate cancer, and by extension, women with breast cancer. The guiding principle of all work has been a very simple idea, a radical idea in the sense of getting to the root. What is the cause? And I've been showing this slide for, for uh, decades, um, which is we spend so much time in medicine mopping up the floor without turning off the faucet. It's like when a doctor when it puts a patient on 
statins to lower cholesterol or blood pressure meds or diabetes meds, and the patient says, doctor, how long do I have to take these? What does the doctor usually say? Forever. It's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Forever. Well, why don't we turn off the faucet? And the, to a larger degree than we had once realized, the faucet, the underlying cause, are the lifestyle choices that we make each day. And what we're finding, and what continually amazes me, is that our bodies often have this remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized, if we can treat the underlying cause and turn off the faucet. And, the, and, and to me, the value of doing research, and why I spend so much time doing studies, is it can redefine what's possible. Everything I'll be sharing with you this morning was thought impossible uh, before these studies were done. And it's a disruptive technology in the same way that a, an iPhone or a, an electric car. It's not just an incremental change. So 40 years ago, when I was a second year medical student, I began the first of a series of studies showing that lifestyle changes could reverse heart disease. And it culminated in what's called a lifestyle heart trial. And we used the state-of-the-art measures, quantitative arteriography to measure blockages, cardiac PET scans to measure blood flow, and cardiac events. And what we found was that, the clicker is going a little faster than I am, uh, is that when we looked at all the arteries in all the patients, they got more clogged after one year in the top line and even more clogged after five years. That's what usually happens with people with heart disease. But we found instead of getting worse and worse, the patients got better and better. They showed some reversal after one year and even more reversal after five years. And we published the one-year findings in The Lancet and the five-year findings in the Journal of the AMA. We also found a 40% reduction in LDL cholesterol, comparable to what you can get with statins, but without the costs and without the side effects. We found a 400% improvement in blood flow to the heart in these patients compared to the, the uh, control group. And this is a representative patient. In the upper left, you can see the narrowing in one of the arteries of the heart. A year later, it's less clogged. And because blood flow is a fourth power function of the radius, even small changes in blockages cause big improvements in blood flow, and in this case, a 400% improvement. On the lower left, at the beginning, blue and black is no blood flow on the PET scan. The lower right, a year later, it's orange and white, which means uh, normal blood flow. And it wasn't just a few patients that skewed the, the mean. 99% of the patients were able to stop or reverse the progression of their heart disease, whereas only 5% of the control group patients got better. And one of the interesting findings that surprised me, I thought when I began doing this work that the younger patients with milder disease would do better, but I was wrong. It wasn't how old they were, it wasn't how sick they were, it was simply a function of how much they changed their lifestyle. The more they changed, the more they improved in every way we could measure. And the more they changed, the better they felt, and the better they felt, the more they wanted to keep doing it, which is why we're getting such high levels uh, of adherence. And we also found that there were two and a half times as many heart attacks, strokes, bypasses, angioplasties, and stents in the control group as in the experimental group. Now, we've been training hospitals and clinics and physician groups around the country. I've been partnering with uh, ShareCare, and one of the sites we trained is at Elkhart Memorial Hospital in South Bend, Indiana. And one of the patients was so sick, he was told he needed a heart transplant. And while waiting for a donor, he went through our program. And nine weeks later, his heart disease improved so much and his ability of the heart to pump blood improved so much, he didn't need a heart transplant anymore. It's like, what's the more radical intervention here? A heart transplant or eat well, move more, stress less, love more? Not to mention that it saves over a million dollars for the, for the payer. And we have uh, well over a dozen people who've been able to avoid heart transplants just by changing lifestyle just to show you how powerful these approaches can be. So the local CBS affiliate did a short segment on, on, on the program there. I'm just going to play it for you as an indication of the kinds of things that can happen when you make these changes to this degree. Program at two local hospitals is promising to undo heart disease for patients with heart trouble. And this prescription includes no medication. Yeah. Really interesting. WSBT 22's Kristen Bean is here. And Kristen, it does, though, include a lot of lifestyle changes. Yeah, but the results are amazing. Right now, the Ornish Reversal Program is offered at Memorial and Elkhart General Hospitals. It isn't easy, but patients who participate say it's worth it. We actually were working seven days a week for probably three months. David Foster is 57. He's a Navy veteran and a retired paramedic. He and his wife are raising a beautiful eight-month-old baby girl adopted as a newborn. But in July, he was told he would need a heart transplant. What goes through your mind when someone says you need a heart transplant? Pretty much nothing. Everything around you kind of ceases, you know. He says you need a heart transplant. All you can think is, uh-oh, now what am I going to do? His heart troubles had caught up with him. He had 100% blockages in his heart. That's when someone told him about the Ornish reversal program. Doctors say it's scientifically proven to undo heart disease. I had made up my mind there and there that I was going to beat this thing. So I, I've never really thought about the dying. Not at all. 
I've thought about more of what do I need to do to continue my life and change it. The Ornish program requires patients to make major lifestyle changes. They spend nine weeks learning how to eat a low-fat, plant-based diet. They have to exercise, undergo stress management, and participate in group support. This is a sort of a lifestyle prescription. We're not going to be taking a pill, but we're going to modify what we do in our life and we're going to build our life around these healthy practices so that we can enjoy a healthy life, not spend our life in fear of when the next cardiac event is coming. Doctors say 90% of patients who complete the program continue these lifestyle changes after a year. Foster is sticking with his and recently learned his heart function has improved and he no longer needs that heart transplant. I say, I don't think about death. I just think about the day. This is why I love doing this work, though, because you can hear these stories, and stories are powerful. We then did a study to see whether we could reverse early stage prostate cancer, and we did that in collaboration with the chair of urology at UCSF, Dr. Peter Carroll, and the chair at, at the time at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And we took men who had biopsy proven prostate cancer who had elected to do watchful waiting so we could have a non intervention control group for comparison. And what we found was that the PSA levels got worse in the control group, got better, went down in the experimental group, again, in direct proportion to the degree of lifestyle change. We found that the tumor growth in vitro was inhibited 70% in the experimental group versus only 9% in the control group, also in direct proportion to the degree of lifestyle change. And the tumor activity shown in this patient with uh, an MR spectroscopy scan shown in red was diminishing or shrinking, as well as the PSA coming down. And none of the experimental group patients needed surgery or radiation or chemo, whereas six of the control group patients did in the first year. So we wondered what some of the mechanisms might be to help explain why people can get better so quickly. And so we looked at changes in their gene expression. Uh, and we found, and we did this study, and it was published with uh, Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome. And we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months, turning on the good genes that keep us healthy, turning off the genes that cause uh, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, and particularly downregulating what are called oncogenes that promote prostate, breast, and colon cancer, just within three months turning them off, which is really, uh, I was amazed when we could see how powerful these changes can be. This is what's called a heat map. On the right column are different genes that cause cancer. On the left at the beginning, uh, red is turned on, and three months later, green is turned off, just again to show how powerful these simple lifestyle changes can be. So our genes are a predisposition, but our genes are not our fate. And so often I'm sure you hear patients say, oh, I've just got bad genes, what can I do? Well, it turns out you can do a lot, not to blame, but to empower, because we can actually change that. We then did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize in medicine for her pioneering work with telomeres. And most of you know telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes because they regulate cellular aging. And as we get older, they, our telomeres tend to get shorter. And as our telomeres get shorter, our lives tend to get shorter, and the risk of premature death from pretty much everything goes up correspondingly. We found that in just three months, the telomerase, the enzyme she discovered that repairs and lengthens telomeres, went up by 30%. And over a five-year period, we found that we could actually lengthen telomeres. It's still the only control study showing that any intervention, including pharma, can actually lengthen telomeres in a very real sense, reversing aging at a cellular level, whereas the control group uh, got shorter. And again, we found that the more people change their lifestyle, the longer their telomeres got at any age. Now, it's worth mentioning that with all this interest in personalized medicine, it wasn't like there was one set of lifestyle prescriptions for heart disease, a different one for diabetes, or for prostate cancer, or your genes, or your telomeres. It was the same for all of them. And I think it's because many of these uh, chronic diseases share very similar underlying mechanisms, all of which are directly affected by diet and lifestyle. Now, there's a common misconception that many doctors have oh, I can get my patients to take their statins, but there's no way they're going to change their lifestyle. And yet most patients are not taking their statins. Half to two-thirds are not taking them after just four to six months, even though they're of proven value in people who have heart disease. And 20% never even fill their prescriptions. And the reason is, is that statins don't make you feel better, but lifestyle changes do. And when you make your life these lifestyle changes, uh, you feel so much better so quickly because these mechanisms are so dynamic that it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying or fear of a heart attack or fear of something bad happening to joy and pleasure and love and freedom, which really make life worth doing. And even though the program is only nine weeks long, we're finding that 85 to 90 percent of people are still following our lifestyle program after a year in every site that we've trained, including in not just in big cities, but in South Bend, Indiana, and Jackson, Mississippi, and places like that. Because, you know, our, this is really a, what you might call a love-based program. 
You know, when people feel loved and cared for, they're much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life-enhancing than ones that are self-destructive. And the reason is, is that we're always making choices. You know, if you're here today, you could be on the strip doing all kinds of stuff. Um, if we know that something is worth doing, that what we gain is more than what we give up, then those choices become sustainable and, and worth doing. And again, because these mechanisms are so dynamic, you don't have to wait long to see the benefits. Now, one of the sites we trained is at UCLA, and a, a member of the LAPD um, was having chest pain, and it was found that after nine weeks in our program, this 50% blockage where the arrow is became almost undetectable. And it wasn't when I talked to the interventional cardiologist, it wasn't a, a plaque that uh, dissolved, I mean, a, a thrombus that dissolved or a spasm. It was an actual plaque that, uh, that resorbed after just nine weeks. Again, showing even though these, these plaques often take years or even decades to build up, we can measure improvements very quickly if the lifestyle changes are big enough. And as most of you know, 86% of the $3.2 trillion that we spent last year on healthcare, which is mostly sick care, are for chronic diseases that are largely preventable or reversible by changing lifestyle. And it turns out that 5% of the population accounts between 50 to 80% of healthcare costs. Those are the people that we work with. And we've been able to show that if you're doing primary prevention, it may take years to show the benefits. And so many insurance companies say, why should we spend our money today for some future benefit that someone else is gonna get? But if you work with the 5% of people that are sick, that have these chronic diseases, and show that we can reverse them with lifestyle, we show that we can save a lot of money in the first year. And the first study that we did was with, um, uh, with, was, uh, with Mutual of Omaha, and we found that almost 80% of people who were told they needed to have a bypass or a stent were able to safely avoid it by choosing our lifestyle program as a direct alternative. And Mutual of Omaha found they saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year. Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield was not only covering our program, but providing it in 24 sites in West Virginia, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania. And they found that compared to a control group matched for age and gender and disease severity, they cut their costs in half in the first year, uh, and, it re and, re and, re and it remained low after two to three years. And when they looked at the subgroup of people that they'd spent at least $25,000 on in the preceding year, they cut their costs by 400%. So these, these, these approaches are not only medically effective, they're also cost effective as well. And we did a demonstration project with Highmark, and we found that uh, um, in, in 24 different sites, and we found significant improvements in every metric. And I'll just go through a few of these. We found a 19-pound, these are beginning 12 weeks, one year. The program was only 12 weeks long, but a year later, we're still showing improvements. 19-pound uh, weight loss, this is uh, better weight than weight loss data than Weight Watchers, but we're not focusing on weight, we're focusing on health, and then everything gets better in ways that don't compromise your health. Angina shows striking uh, reductions. Most people come pain-free within the first few weeks. And so for someone who can't work or make love with their spouse or play with their kids or walk across the street without getting chest pain, and within a few weeks, they're essentially sometimes a few days, they're pain-free. They say, well, I like eating junk food, but not that much because I feel so much better. And then it comes out of their own experience. They say, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. So I'll do more of this and less of that. The ability to exercise increases quickly and, and stays up. Um, you know, the old joke, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I eat and live healthily? Turns out not to be true. Um, you know, the quality of life improves dramatically in these patients. Systolic blood pressure shows sustained reductions. So does diastolic blood pressure. Uh, and blood sugar comes down and stays down. Um, even though we were able to reduce or discontinue many of these medications, they still show these uh, uh, significant reductions in everything we could measure. And one of the most interesting to me is that depression scores were cut almost in half. And depression is a real epidemic in our society. It's part of the reason why we have an opioid epidemic or you know, people say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is, or food fills that void, or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain, or you know, video games numb the pain, or working all the time numbs the pain. So we've learned it's not enough to focus on information or behavior. We need to work at a deeper level, which for many people is the sense of loneliness and depression and isolation, which is what our uh, support groups are designed to, to be the an antidote to. Um, through my nonprofit institute, we've trained 53 sites around the country, and like now, we got bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings, better adherence, but a number of the sites closed down because we didn't have the reimbursement. So that set me on a 16-year journey with CMS to try to get Medicare coverage, and I'm very grateful to them that they provided that in a new benefit category called intensive cardiac rehabilitation. So in partnership with ShareCare, we've been training sites around the country to help create a new paradigm of healthcare based on lifestyle medicine for the reasons we've been talking about. 
and Medicare will pay for people with heart disease. Many of the other insurance companies like HMSA and Blue Shield and, and, and others are covering it for uh, type 2 diabetes and some for tumor risk factors. And I think as we continue to gather data showing how well this is working, we hope that the number of companies that are covering it and the indications will go up correspondingly. Right now, Aetna is covering it in all 50 states, with Mark Bertolini, Anthem in all 14 states it covers and so on. And uh, it's, it's getting much more easy uh, to, to do that. If you go to our website, all these things are, are, are there, all the sites we've trained and information on, on uh, how this can be available. Everything on there is free. Our model is to train the trainer. So the physician is quarterback, but he or she doesn't spend a lot of time doing this because most doctors don't have much time. So it's a doctor, a nurse, a meditation teacher, exercise physiologist, dietitian, and psychologist. And, they, and Medicare and most insurance companies will pay for 72 hours of training. And we divide that into 18 four-hour sessions. So people come, if they work, they come, say, from 5 to 9, or otherwise they come uh, uh, during the day. They get an hour of supervised exercise, as you'd find in a traditional cardiac rehab program. But they also get an hour of, of, of meditation and yoga, an hour of a support group, which is really what is enabled us to get such high levels of adherence, and an hour of a lecture with a group meal. It's all done turnkey. And Medicare is reimbursing this at about $136 an hour in California, which works out to be almost $10,000 a patient. So whereas before we found that it wasn't enough to, to have good outcomes, we had to have reimbursement. Now we do, and so that makes it sustainable. If you change reimbursement, you change medical practice and even medical education <clears throat> in, in ways that are really helpful. But more than that, it allows us to reclaim why most of us went into medicine in the first place. If you only have eight minutes to see a patient, you don't have time to talk about what they're eating, what's going on with their marriage, their kids, their family, their work. You basically, you know, go through the EMR, write a progress note, you know, listen to heart and lungs, write a prescription. It's profoundly unsatisfying for both doctors and patients. Now we have a way where the physician can leverage his or her time, but isn't spending most of their time doing that, and yet the patient benefits from that. The other thing, and the last thing I want to talk about is that the real epidemic isn't just a heart disease or diabetes. As I mentioned before, it's depression and isolation with the breakdown of the social networks that used to give people a sense of connection and community. You know, 50 years ago, most people had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a job that felt secure. They had a church or synagogue they went to regularly. They had two or three generations of, uh, they had extended family that they saw regularly. Um, and many people don't have any of those things. And you say, well, okay, so what? Well, what's interesting to me is that study after study has shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to ten times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community, in part because you're more likely to abuse yourself, in part for reasons we don't fully understand. But we know that it's true. And so it's not enough to give people information and expect them to change. I mean, it's not like I say, hey, Mr. Jones, I don't want you to smoke, it's bad for you. And they go, well, I didn't know smoking's bad for me. I'll quit today. Everybody knows it's bad for them. It's like, you have to say, why do you smoke? You know, why do you do these things? And they say, because they help us deal with our pain, our loneliness, our depression, the 20 friends in the pack of cigarettes that I mentioned earlier. And so the support groups we have are not just helping people stay on the diet. We create a safe environment where people can talk about what's really going on in their lives without fear that someone's going to judge them or criticize them or, or give them glib advice and so on and by helping people focus on their feelings and expressing them authentically. You know, there's a study that came out recently that the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are. And the reason is, is that you don't post your authentic life on Facebook, most people don't. It's, you know, you look through other people's, what looks like their perfect life, it's like, well, how come mine isn't like that? Whereas if you grew up in a family with two or three generations of people, they know you, they don't just know your, you know, your Facebook profile or the nice intro that I got today. It's they know where you messed up and you know that they know and they know that you know that they know and they're still there for you. It's kind of like what James Cameron wrote in uh, Avatar, you know, I see you, which is really from an African proverb. I see all of you, not just your good stuff. And there's just something primal about being seen and connected in that way. That anything that promotes a sense of intimacy is healing. Even the word healing comes from the root to make whole. You know, yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, to bring together. These are really very old ideas that we're rediscovering. And so for me, part of the joy in doing this work is that when someone is hurting, there's an opportunity to help guide them and to transform their lives, to rediscover you know, a sense of inner peace and meaning and joy and pleasure in their lives. So often the people say things to me like, you know, having a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I go, what are you nuts? And they'd say, no, this is what it took to get my attention that's really helped me transform my life in ways that have made it so much more joyful and so much more meaningful and so much more pleasurable. And when we can work on that level, 
then we can help people use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming their lives in ways that are incredibly meaningful, not only for them, but for those of us who do this work. So I'm really grateful to you for the chance to be here today. I know that each of you in your own way is doing the same kinds of things of helping alleviate suffering. And I think that's why we're here. And that's why I'm grateful to be here today. Thank you so much.